You're listening to What It's Like with Luce, a podcast highlighting ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I'm your host, Lucy Norris, and this week I'm joined by founder and CEO of Flipdish. Born out of a frustration with food portal usability, the platform was developed to act as an online ordering system for restaurants. Talking me through the initial startup process to present day operations and future projects, including self service kiosks and even food delivering drones, here's what it's like to be Connor McCarthy. Welcome, Connor. Thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, I think we will just dive straight in and start with the first question. Have you always envisioned yourself as an entrepreneur or was there potentially like a different path before that? Um, no, I wouldn't. Definitely wouldn't have always thought of myself as an entrepreneur. Um, when I was young, I definitely didn't know what I wanted to do. I remember being maybe seven or eight and wanting to be a vet um, because okay. I liked animals. <laughs> so back then, no, I don't think I thought of myself as an entrepreneur. Uh, but I guess when I was a teenager, I found myself um, wheeling and dealing a little bit. Um, I would have been the one to um, have a little side business going on in school, that type of thing. Mm. Um, so when, when I was maybe 13, uh, MP3 came out as a format for uh, songs. Um, I do believe it before that you couldn't download songs on the internet at all. Uh, so I discovered MP3 and you could spend like an hour and download one song because it took a long time back then and CD burners were just coming out and you could put 12 or 13 songs on a CD and it would burn them for an hour and I found myself, I was 13, uh, doing that for my friends so they would send me a list of all their songs that they wanted to have all on one, in one place on one CD and I put them from their CDs onto one CD or find the new songs and sell them them um, so I guess that was one early uh, entrepreneurial thing I did Mm-hmm. Um, and then why software development? Like, What was it about that that kind of drew you to that? I don't know what initially kicked it off. Um, I remember wanting to get into software for a long time um, when I was... So I only started writing software when I was t- maybe 20. And I, had, I know that I tried one, uh, a little earlier, maybe when I was 17. Um, I'd asked a friend who, was, who wrote software at the time um, how to get, get into it and he said I would just get a book and read it so I got a book I think it was called Beginning Marker, or Beginning uh, uh, Mac OS Programming and um, so I bought that book and I said hey, is this a good book and he, said, he just had a really quick glance at the cover and said yeah that's fine so I opened it up and I couldn't make heads or tails of it so it was like really I, it seemed so so difficult for me um, and I kind of gave up a bit then for a few years and then after I went to college and learned how to program um, better, I looked back at that book and realized that it was, although it was called Beginning Mac Programming, it was about converting, uh, for professional programmers who knew how to code everything, just start working on a Mac as opposed to Windows programming or something. So okay, it was so maybe a in. bit advanced. It was really complex. <laughs> yeah, it was way, way too advanced. Um, so I realized I wasn't just an idiot. It was a very, very difficult book. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I saw that you got your kind of early career, we'll call it, in software development, arised out of um, your love of playing like online poker. Yeah, so um, in the last year of school, my friends and I discovered Texas Hold'em. It was really big back then. Um, Chris Monimore here won the World uh, the world Series of Poker. He was, a, a, I think, the first amateur to win it and suddenly poker exploded around the world and we were all caught up in that so we used to play poker every uh, Saturday down on Beauty's Hotel in uh, Bullsbridge there and I then started playing online poker and the first uh, kind of software related thing I did um, when I was playing poker was I realised that if you were playing like a, a little tournament it was with very, very low stakes people played in a very uh, predictable way and if you were paying any sort of attention, you would notice that if somebody hasn't raised for 30 hands and then they raise at, at very low stakes, then typically they have a good hand. Um, and all you have to do is pay a little bit of attention. But I didn't want to pay attention. So <laughs> um, I'd write a little program which would record um, how many times people had raised during the game and just make a little check beside their name. So I could just as soon as somebody raised, I could look and see, oh, they haven't raised for 30 minutes, they probably have a hand I should fold, or I can see that they've raised every single hand, and I would know probably they don't, so you could re-raise them and they fold, that type of thing. 
that was the first little uh, bit of uh, software I wrote and then um, leading on from that I wrote some software which would record all of the information about pants that were going on and you could then import that into other software which I didn't make uh, which would show you all the stats about your uh, opponents so how, how much they raised, how much they folded, uh, give you loads of information about them and what you could do then is you could record, if you leave the uh, my program recording for uh, hours beforehand or days beforehand and then when you sit down to play people for the first time you've never played them before you'd have all this information about how they have their, their playing style which made it much much easier to um, well win online um, and then that evolved into um, recording the hands and selling the hands to other poker players so they could do the same. Mm -hmm. And was all this while you were at college or was it alongside working that a job? That started while I was in college and then uh, I continued it while I was working as a developer okay. in my first job. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so I guess I'm curious to know how the shift came about from starting to develop software in, in an area like poker to then what you have now which is Flipdish um, software for the food industry. Uh, okay, so I, there was b b before I got into before Flipdish started and after uh, the hand histories uh, piece of business, and um, there was a five years or so where me and another developer who I met while working in a poker company here in Dublin, uh, which includes there's loads of poker and gambling companies set up here. Um, they all have different names, some, like some software house name you wouldn't realize, but they're running massive poker uh, <coughs> and gambling sites. So I was working with one of those in Dublin, and me and another developer decided to start our own uh, poker site and the iPhone had been out for three years and it was impossible to play real money poker on it and the iPad was just about to be launched so we decided to build a poker site which would let you play on the iPad and iPhones and we so we did that we wrote all the software for it uh, we got a gaming license and bank accounts and all of that and launched it and it was the first place you could play uh, real money poker on iPhones and iPads and that was uh, it was great fun, a big learning experience. Uh, we had to market to customers and build up an affiliate uh, network to have affiliates refer uh, poker players to us and that type of thing. And so we did that and I ran that for five years. And after, well, it was a great learning experience, but it wasn't ever going to be a huge business for us. Uh, we had uh, all the big guns were getting involved and mm -hmm. it was becoming a uh, more and more difficult to run a poker site as it, uh, countries were trying to put uh, tax uh, poker players and okay. um, because there was loads of loads of people were playing poker and all the money was being sent off to some company in I don't know the uh, Costa Rica or somewhere yeah and no tax was being paid and countries wanted to uh, put a tax on it so what they did was they'd require uh, each uh, a poker site to have a license in each country uh, so we, for example, get a letter from the, the French government saying you need to have a license in France or else you have to stop taking our players or allowing our players to play. And I wanted to be able to go on holidays in France and stuff. So we didn't have a license there, so we, we would just like block off the country of France. So we'd use a whole section of uh, players. And that would keep happening for more and more countries um, to get a license. And uh, it would cost like, probably a million euro plus. Okay. And also you would need to, those players could only play against themselves. So you'd need a, uh, a critical mass of players in each country that you had players in. So it's getting more and more difficult. And yeah. also I didn't really, although I love the technical challenge of building the software, and I love the challenge of marketing it and getting people to play, uh, I wasn't really a business I liked being in. Um, you, you, have to, you realize like I only ever played poker for fun and I really enjoyed it and me and my friends played for fun but when you're running a poker site you realise people get addicted to it and are play and lose way more than you think is healthy and I really didn't like being part of that so I was looking for something a bit more um, that would bring a bit more value to the world. So you decide to kind of wrap up the poker business um, and move on to something else. Mm -hmm. So how did Flip Dish come about? What was the initial thinking behind that? So the initial thinking was that we would create a, a food marketplace. Uh, mm -hmm. We want, so I had, I remember when I was doing my software masters that we had to do a project and 
in for two weeks just we have to make a website where you just go and do something and to record something to the database just to teach us how to do stuff. I thought that maybe I could do a website where you could place order for food to a restaurant. Then I googled it and I saw, oh, there's actually you can do that already. It's not new. You can. Yeah. Some restaurants do have websites. It's back in two thousand. I don't know eight or seven or I don't know, but a while ago. <laughs> um, so I saw that it could be done, so I, I ignored it and moved on. But then um, in 2014, I was looking again. I was trying to order food myself, and the it, I noticed that the user experience was no better than it seemed five or six years before. Uh, it was really painful to place an order online. Um, some restaurants had websites, and you'd get to check out, and it just wouldn't work. Um, others... Were, there were food marketplaces, um, huge um, multinational companies who had signed up lots of restaurants across Ireland and the experience on mobile was still really poor. Um, so for I remember I was sitting down trying to order food on Saturday and I had to enter, I knew I'd ordered the week before on the same app and I had to enter my credit card number again because it didn't remember it. Uh, you, just, you just had to enter it every time back then. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to type in my address even though I was on my phone and there's geolocation and it shouldn't know, it knows where I am, could yeah. know. Um, and I had to reset my password because I forgot the password. And so I had to go to my email and open the link and all that. So it was just really painful. It was easier to call the restaurants. Yeah. Um, and because I was just annoyed that <laughs> evening uh, trying to place food and order for food, I thought I should, I could do way better at it. Um, so I started mocking up designs um, working out the, the how to design an app where you could order food with the fewest possible taps or clicks um and yeah so i spent quite a while just trying to go through different uh, scenarios and flows i was trying to work out should you put the map at the beginning or choose your food first and then put the map later on and that's all those type of things um mm. at this time as well was the likes of just eat and delivery out already or did they come mm. after so delivery wasn't but just eat was there okay. and the usability of that app they got much better but back then it was not a great user experience mm-hmm. uh, so yeah that uh, pushed me towards doing something better yeah did you ever, like i would be curious to know what your attitude is towards potentially entering a market where there is such strong competitors I know obviously you're going to come with, with something different, but did that ever worry you at all? Um, yeah, well, yes. I, I wouldn't say it worried me. I knew they were there. Um, but I, I just felt that if there was a product that had a much better user experience, then people would prefer to use it. And I know that's not always the case. There are many situations where people will use the worst product because it's marketed better or yeah. um, for loads of reasons. Bus. it didn't put me off mm-hmm. um so yeah so we went um myself and james my brother uh, we started building it um we raised some money from our family to get somebody to build the mobile app itself um i did buy a uh, book on how to <laughs> <laughs> write <laughs> ios uh, software and after a week or two of reading it and trying to write some code i realized we should get somebody uh, who had done this before mm. um so yeah, so we raised a bit of small amount of money and found a developer who would uh, write the uh, write the program, write the app. Uh, I went ahead and wrote all the kind of server side software at the back end, the dealing with the payments and the creating accounts and all that. And James got to work on marketing uh, our food portal, Flipdish. And then after we had built all of the software, we start went and spoke to our first restaurants. And to sign them up to us, and they um, had some interesting information for us. They re- told, they basically said they really did not want another marketplace. They um, educated both of us to lots of problems they were having with food portals. Um, they said that they, I mean, even though our app was really nice and easy to use, they really didn't feel uh, that mattered to them. What they said, uh, they said their problems with the marketplaces were that. Well, if they sent a customer to a marketplace, all of their competitors were in that app, which uh, they didn't like because they felt they were sending their customers, uh, they were giving them away to uh, their competitors. Um, and they had no control over how high they were listed in the app. And they knew that they could have, they could have a really good brand. So lots of people were trying to order from them and they send them to a marketplace and then their competitor would be listed above them because they're paying to be up there. And um, they didn't like that. Um, 
they had they told us the fees they were charged by marketplaces but the, well, the marketplace in Ireland had gone up every single year since it was introduced in Ireland and they felt very controlled by it and they didn't see a way out for themselves other than being able to accept orders directly and they knew that their customers wanted to order from them but uh, online but they didn't have the technology to let uh, them let them do it to enable us and they some of them have tried to get somebody to build them a website which would um, allow their customers to place orders online um, but that tended either to not uh, to end up with a not a very usable website because it's quite difficult to build a very user-friendly system um, and even when it was user-friendly and it worked over the years technology moved on mm -hmm. and then they were left maintaining this website and they're trying to run a restaurant and the, the maintenance is very uh, difficult and expensive because new phones come out new screen sizes new retina resolution uh, screens and so forth and everything needs to change and then something would happen like their e they, they'd be reliant on some service like something that sells emails and that service would disappear and they'd have to revisit and get it to find a developer to come back and fix it all for them so what they wanted was an off-the-shelf solution which would let them receive orders directly they'd have their own branding on it they could send push notifications to their customers they have their logo on their customer's phone which they see hundreds of times a day and um, they'd be able to have their own loyalty systems and their own factory goals and all that type of thing and um, so we had built this marketplace uh, with this lovely software and then all these restaurants told us that they didn't want it what they wanted was their own system so we reworked it and um, at the beginning so a year in at the beginning of 2016 we started to do uh, that we offered restaurants their widely called uh, websites and mobile apps and I'm also I'm looking at this fancy machine behind me um, I read that you guys have put these kiosks into a few restaurants around Dublin can you tell me yep. a bit more about that and how that kind of came yep. to life? Yeah, um, so what we're looking at here is a self-service kiosk, which lets, which would let somebody walking into a restaurant or a cafe place an order without talking to a staff member. Um, so we actually had a kiosk in a store back in late 2016, and we, we did it because we were asked by a store hey, can we put your Android app on this tablet and put it in the store and let people order from it? And we're like, uh, yeah, go for it. So <laughs> they did that and they had it running for a couple of years. But back then we were busy doing our online ordering business and also it, it felt like the time wasn't quite right for kiosks. Um, but since then, things have changed massively in uh, the last three years. Um, for Most notably, McDonald's have put thousands and thousands of kiosks yeah. into all, well, lots of their restaurants and aiming for all of them, I believe. Um, and they've shown that it works really, really well, both for the restaurants and the customer. Um, so what everyone has seen with uh, the McDonald's um, experiment is that people like, lots of people prefer ordering with kiosks. They will um, order more when they use them um, for whatever reason. Maybe they, it's because they can see lovely images of uh, the food and there's no time pressure because um, they're not holding up a person when they're giving them the order and they also aren't don't feel like they're being judged for what they're ordering <laughs> so they uh, are more free to order whatever they want um, so yeah it's worked really well for McDonald's and now uh, well over the last year um, we see that there's lots of smaller uh, businesses restaurants and cafes will well will want to do the same but they'll really need to do it to compete with um, these large companies like McDonald's but they don't have the resources to build it themselves they can't go and source har hardware and build their own software and run do all the uh, integrations that are required behind the scenes. Um, so we have done that for them and are offering this off the shelf solution for them. Um, so yeah, they're very they're in a good few restaurants around Dublin and the UK now. Um, yeah, they're very uh, it's going very well. The restaurants really seem to like them. It's great. You can just sit in just cafe next to us. You can sit in there and see all the people come up and use the kiosk and mm -hmm. place their orders and the staff. Uh, really seem to like it because uh, well one bit of feedback we got was this 
staff members hated having to remember and know Irish people's names because oh. typically, even for Irish people, it can be difficult uh, yeah. when you've got Quilon and Quiva and so forth coming in. Uh, but if you're a foreigner, it's next to impossible and they have to try and write this name down, not knowing how to spell it, and then call out the customer when it's uh, when their food is ready. Uh, but now with the kiosk, they just get an order number and they can say, yeah, order number 23 is ready. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes it much easier for them operationally. Um, and it means they can... Uh, they don't need to stand at the desk waiting for a customer to come in all day. Um, and they can go off, they can clean, they can do loads of other things that are beneficial to the restaurants. Um, yeah, and I suppose one particular area we're seeing them be uh, particularly useful in is at uh, businesses where there's a very um, distinct peak period. So, place, for example, places do a lot of lunchtime trade. Yeah. They get, they're very... Uh, there's very little going on um, in the mid-morning and then very little going on in the late afternoon. But between one and two, they're absolutely slammed and they have way more uh, customers than they can handle just for that really short period. And that m- means, well, one, it's very different from to hire to staff for that. They, you can't really hire someone for an hour and a half a day. Yeah. Just, people don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and it, yeah, so it means that they have too many customers uh, over that period, so they're losing business. But with the kiosks, they can um, have enough kiosks to receive all the orders for as many people who come in, and then the staff who would have been out there uh, taking the orders can help prepare the food. So they can massively increase their uh, throughput. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the drone service. Mm-hmm. How is that going? Um, well, so that the, these drones are being um, built by a company called Mana yeah. uh, in Dublin, so that's a different company to Flipdish. Mm-hmm. Um, we are doing whatever we can to help Mana and uh, get it going by putting them in contact with restaurants and having making it possible for um, there to be an integration so that when somebody places an order for food, a drone gets notified and um, delivers the food. But it's like something out of Futurama yeah. or something like that. Very yeah, cool. well, I think, like it makes so much sense. I mean, yeah. pe- people think, oh, the drone's so futuristic and uh, that'll never happen, but they're not... Like we put people on the moon like 50 years ago or something, there's pe- human beings flying across our heads at the moment, so surely we can have some food just fly around. It yeah. doesn't seem uh, out of the realm of possibility at all. Um, and then going back to kind of the whole process of bringing Flip Dish to life, do you remember maybe any moment during that process that you kind of felt? That this was really going to work, maybe like the securing of a client or something like that. Um, well, I remember at the very beginning when we were running the marketplace, we had lots of restaurants listed in our app, and we hadn't signed them up. And um, we an order would come through to us, and we, me and myself, James, would get a text message, and then we'd have to ring the restaurants and put the order through by hand. Okay. Um, which was uh, great fun for about two days. And then, yeah, I'd say that got a bit much after a while. Yeah, uh, yeah it got uh, a bit tiring um, every single evening being interrupted by like lots of different text messages and having to call the restaurants and so forth. Um, but then we would sign, our, well, we finally signed up a customer and we were able to put a printer in the restaurant and we saw an order be placed by a customer and then received by the restaurants and then accept it and then deliver the food. That was a uh, great feeling, yeah. That um, well, uh, it was nice to actually see the whole flow go through. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I remember our first pizza that we ordered to the office. Um, like we uh, we placed it all through our own system and saw that uh, the restaurants um, uh, received it, and then the pizza arrived. And I remember thinking, "This is great! It only cost like forty thousand euro or something to uh, build all this and receive a pizza." It felt like a very expensive pizza. Um, so. Yeah, the first order went through. That was um, impactful. Other than that, yeah, I, well, I suppose when we moved to doing the white label, we saw that the restaurants were really bought in to us. They they wanted their customers to use their direct ordering, and that was really interesting to see. Whereas when we had the marketplace, they were ex- they wanted us to bring them the customers, which was fine. It was a marketplace. That's what it's meant to do. But when we had white label ordering, they were really um, they really were uh, motivated to have people order from uh, directly through the white label as opposed to uh, through the marketplace. And when we saw that behavior, um, that was very um, interesting and good to see. Um, yeah, and that helps 
direction, the company. Mm -hmm. And obviously, whenever you're starting anything new, there's always going to be a few like hiccups and things like that. Um, what do you feel is potentially either the biggest challenge or the biggest mistake that you made throughout the flip dish process? Hmm. There's so many cha many challenges. Um, it seems there are lots of small challenges. There's n none right now that stand out. Um, well, that must be good to be in that situation. Well, it, it could just be that they're all big challenges. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> yeah. noticing the, any stand out. Um, yeah, well, I, I suppose right now um, we are trying to hire a, for a couple of roles, and that is really challenging. Um, so we're trying to hire a UX person who can help and make sure that we get our designs right earlier on as opposed to putting designs out there and then getting feedback uh, weeks later from customers. It would be nice if we could um, speed up that process by having a really experienced UX person mm -hmm. um, in here. So hiring for that is difficult. Uh, hiring a product owner to um, also help us build new products, that's proving difficult. Um, yeah, so hiring is so, well, so it's something we've had to uh, do a lot of after doing a lot of over the last year so we've gone from about 20 to 90 people in 12 or 13 months okay so that's big. uh yeah so i suppose um if you're doing that hiring is a problem no matter what <laughs> <laughs> no matter what's going on uh, and to hire 80 people you need to uh interview like hundreds and hundreds so yeah it was a lot of work uh we've great team now though but as we're still trying to hire people so that's a challenge mm -hmm. um how did you find it kind of going from like obviously, you always want your business to expand to this level where you have a really nice office and teams and things. But how did you find kind of, I guess, from a personal level, stepping into that role of being like CEO or having to to kind of be on top of this huge thing that yeah. you're building that keeps growing? So it was so yeah so there's so there's lots of aspects to it. So things that happened were at the beginning there was only uh, a few of us, so we could have a a chat and we could every morning we could have a catch up and it'll be fine then it might be seven or eight and we could still do that we might have to each take a lot less time to talk to each other because of eight or ten people talking but then as the company grew it became a situation where we couldn't have these all hands meetings where everyone spoke every day uh, so it fell on me to talk in front of everybody and that like I'm, I'm not no I don't think anyone loves public speaking but no. actually, <laughs> well maybe some people do but I definitely don't um, so it, uh, I found myself in a situation where I had to talk in front of 30 people every single week and then 50 people, 60 people, 90 people every single week. Uh, so that was new, having to do that. Um, and now it's fine. I mean, you really do get used to it. I'm not sure you get good at it, but you get used to it. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was one thing that I found, uh, well, somewhat difficult, but uh, I didn't really ever think of that when we're starting out with a flip dish. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, so the things that were um, somewhat difficult was when we went for maybe about 20 people, we started to need to have other people managing uh, our staff, other than myself or James directly. And that was really new, having people in the company who didn't report directly to you. Yeah. Because um, it was just a new thing that we hadn't been through before and we'd... Um, have something we would want done I would naturally go to that person to say here uh, can you do this and then you think oh should I go to their manager about this and go through them or am I breaking rank or reporting lines by doing this so um, yeah that was a, a change that we have to get used to um, and now it's even further where we have two layers beneath us uh, which is hard because I mean you want to know everyone in the company well but it gets really difficult to do that when there's 90 people and it's like three people, I think three people have joined in the last week. Um, so like I have in my calendar that I have to go for a coffee with them just so I know like what language they speak and that type of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's nice that you even take the time to do that though because I know in some places they don't even take the time to do that. So it sounds like there's a really nice ethos in the office as well. Y yeah, I I really like it. <laughs> a bit of a unique position, but yeah, um, yeah, no, it is great. I think uh, it's very open. Um, like I said, in that we have this meeting every week where everyone, is, which everyone is at, and we talk really openly about the company. We have all of our um, our finances, our stats. We talk about what we're doing. Um, we really 
try and put practices in place where we get feedback from the staff so that um, everyone is involved in what like the direction we're going and how we run things. Um, it's definitely not a top-down approach. Um, like it would be crazy to rely on one person to know how to do everything mm-hmm. when all, we have like 90 people, really intelligent people, <coughs> intelligent people here who are closer to our customers, closer to the product. So yeah, we really try and uh, get the most out of that by having them give feedback and work on the company with us. What is your idea of success? What does that word mean to you? I don't know. Um, so if I was start, so if I could from, if I was five years ago and I could look forward to today, I would think that would, I would consider that success. Yeah. Yeah, I think that back then I would consider it success. But now um, I feel we're such a tiny, tiny little company with only uh, 1,600 uh, mm-hmm. customers and I feel like we're not going to be success until we're the leader in Europe. We've when we've hundreds of thousands of restaurants, um, so I think your what success looks like changes as you go forward. I'm sure like it's not unique to business. If you're an athlete and you're young and you really really want to get on the school team, then you're really happy when you do. But then you want to get on the the like the Leinster team, and then you're you realize oh actually I train hard on the best in the Leinster, I want to play for Ireland. And then, so things progress and your expectations change. Mm-hmm. Um, and what do you want, I don't want to say end goal because I feel like no company ever properly has a definite end goal, but what would a really successful future for Flip Dish look like? So I think it, we, it would look like being a company that is, um, well, stability would be great, which and that means being a few times larger than we are now. Um, it's not that like we're at any risk of going out. Like, just even things go really well. Yeah, things are going very well, and like we've lots of um, very very happy customers and lots of great products and. Um, yeah, so it's not like the word risk, but we would be a lot more stable company if we were five times the size. Um, so having that level of stability and I suppose profitability comes with that. That would be a part of it. Um, but that's really just on the keeping the company alive side of things. Um, what's more um, important is, I think, having a company which is needed by um, our customers. Uh, so like our goal since since we learned since we got the feedback from those restaurants very early on, uh, we made it our goal to give restaurants technology so that they can succeed online and um, have every um, have an edge over their larger competition so that they can have technology that's good as or better than the biggest companies like Domino's and McDonald's and the big food marketplaces. Um, so. If we can provide them with that technology, then that's I would consider that a success. A success. Mm-hmm. And then my final question for you today: If you could sit in front of your ten-year-old self now, from the position you're sitting in today, what is the biggest piece of advice you would give yourself? Uh, buy Bitcoin. <laughs> um, other than that, to be able to answer that, I just think of things I've done wrong. And what have I done? So many to choose from. Um, yeah, I think I would say don't waste time. Um, yeah, so if you find yourself... So I suppose when I was running the poker site, there was two years uh, near the end of the business where I was sort of twiddling my thumbs, waiting for it to wind down, and I think that was a waste of time. I should have moved on earlier. So I think lots lots of situations where lots of people will uh, know that they should move on, but they don't make a move. And I think it would be good advice to more actively think of the future and um, force yourself to move on if you think it's going to happen anyway and not waste time because it, we don't have much time in the grand scheme of things. Well, thank you so much for answering my questions today and for chatting with me. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much for listening. And as always, please don't forget to share, comment and rate this podcast if you like what you hear. I'll be back next week chatting to more inspiring individuals. But for now, this has been What It's Like With Luce.